All right. So hello, everyone. Welcome to Warm Up to Winter Gardening. My name is Kari Quas. I'll be your moderator this evening. I'm joined with jo Joe Crumbly, who's also with me from the Snohomish Conservation District. And we'd like to thank the City of Everett for sponsoring these uh, webinars. This is our second one for fall. The other one that you can be doing is about a rain garden tour, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So thanks again for being here this evening. So again, my name is Kari Quas. Um, I'm the, your moderator tech help. I'm the community engagement project manager with Snohomish Conservation District. Um, since I make these slides, I like to show off my garden as well, <laughs> which is um, kind of where this all began uh, with the Lawns to Lettuce program. And Joe now represents that at the district. But we started with a tank in our front yard, as you can see there. Um, filled with some really rich soil and that rich soil grew all those vegetables, which is in the other picture. So I think you can always start small and you can build and grow from there. So I encourage everybody to try something new. Even in this photograph too, I see this little red flowering current I have and that thing is about six feet tall now. So everything grows and everything changes. So uh, be creative, um, work with your garden. It's there to have fun with and it does great stuff for the environment. So this evening, if you're asking questions, please put those into the Q&A. You can do so at any time. If it's pertinent to what Joe is talking about, I'll just go ahead and ask that of him, and then we'll have time at the end for questions too. Um, also, we are recording this, so I'll be able to send it out to you after the fact. If you have any tech questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. So tonight's flow, um, Joe is gonna cover all kinds of different things. We do have a checklist to summarize it all up and I'll put that in the chat too. Um, but basically it's kind of like, what should you be doing at this time of the year? Um, garden isn't done, um, but there are things that you can do to prepare it for the winter time. And then also look ahead to 2022 and future years and think about what you wanna be doing. So there's really stuff you can be doing during the winter time. So that's what we hope you come out of the session with tonight. So for Everett, again, you probably got this flyer in the mail. Um, last week we did uh, yard care in a changing climate and you can find that recording on our website. Um, but and then April Hines, who is our uh, contact with the city, she's doing a rain barrel sale that's coming up on October 9th. Um, for those who are building barrels, that's great. That class is full. Um, so at this point, just go ahead and Saturday, right? Yeah, this Saturday, you can go buy a barrel, um, cash or check only, and it's $55 per barrel. So you can e email her, ahines at everettwa.gov, or just go to the link on the page there, everettwa.gov slash rain barrels, and you can learn more about that. Get lost on my screen. So quickly, what a conservation district is. Uh, Joe and I both work for the one here in Snohomish County that also represents Camano Island. We have been around 80 years. Our job is simply to protect natural resources. That's our mandate. Uh, we do so in a way that's on a voluntary basis with residents. And so we help with farmers. We help with people who live in the city. We do education like this. We also will come out to your property and take a look and offer guidance on what you may need. So technical assistance. Distance. So by all means, reach out to us. We are here to help. A uh, couple upcoming events I just wanted to point out. It's Orcatober. Uh, Orca Recovery Day is coming up on the 16th of this month, so two Saturdays from now. We're going to be doing an event in Mount Lake Terrace at Lake Ballinger Park, um, open to families. It's going to be a nature walk. There'll be some nature painting, orca swag. You learn the connection to between what we do on the land and how that affects our southern resident killer whales. So it's a great day to get involved. Um, if you go to betterground.org slash ORD, there's other events in Snohomish County and actually all over the region. So if you don't live here, that's fine. You can find one that's closest to you. Um, in our last session, we were talking about native plants, and so I'm just making sure that you have the plant sale dates that Elisa would have mentioned. Pre-order window is going to open January 24th and be open until February 4th, and the pickup dates next year will be March 5th and 6th. And you can go to theplantsale.org to learn more about that. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Joe Crumbly. He's been with the district, I think, coming up on year three. Um, 
he is our gardening guy um, and really the champion behind the Lonzo Lettuce Program and Plan to Row. And if it wasn't COVID, he'd probably be out in a field somewhere harvesting corn. So he's done a lot of different stuff at the district. Um, but today he's going to talk about things you can be doing now through the winter time. And so you can see his contact information there or just reach out again and we'll I'll put it in the chat so you can get back to Joe. So if there's any questions, again, please feel free to put those in the Q&A and I will get those to Joe as we go along. So welcome everybody. And um, without further ado, Joe. Great, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now here, Kari. Let's see. Perfect, well, thank you everyone um, for joining us today. Um, bear with me here. Hopefully my cats are uh, quiet enough in the background anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, my name is Joe Crumbly, Urban Agriculture Program Coordinator here with the Snohomish Conservation District and uh, here to talk to you about winterizing your urban garden spaces. Uh, just a quick overview, we're going to go into, you know, soil preparation, what you're looking for in, in your soil through soil testing, um, adding various amendments like mulch or compost during the winter months. Um, implementing things like rain barrels to make it easier to uh, water your vegetables come the next growing season, um, reseeding the lawn if lawns are something you're interested in, uh, as well as uh, transplanting native perennials, um, what kind of planting zone you're working with, uh, the hardy winter crop list um, that you can plant this time of year um, from bulb um, cover crops, uh, kind of a garden plan, what goes into that, including variables like crop rotation, companion planting, different site specific options that can vary um, location to location all across the county, um, improving soil drainage, and also um, just a fall and winter garden checklist that uh, we came up with, which is kind of a good synopsis of this presentation and also just a really quick, easy, you know, succinct list you can go off of for um, for your home gardening needs for this time of year. So soil preparation. Um, the first step is getting to know with what you're working with or what you're working with um, specifically in your soil, whether it's the nutrient content, whether there's different toxins in there. Um, but when it goes to comes to nutrients, you're thinking about what kinds of main nutrients you're working with, whether it's you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, the acidity in the soil, uh, the carbon um, uh, ratio, uh, what you're looking at. And, and that really can help you uh, understand what you can plant in the upcoming growing season uh, successfully or what kinds of um, soil amendments and nutrients and, and various things you might wanna add to increase uh, certain elements in the soil to make sure that um, you have a wide range uh, of options you can choose from to grow successfully. So soil tests, these, um, you know, one way that you can look at it is they'll measure the fertility in the soil. How well will things grow in your, in your soil, whether it's fruits or vegetables, um, flowers, native perennials or lawn. Um, and so these soil tests measure nutrients present, excuse me, present in the soil. Um, some of these uh, tests can also look at, you know, the organic matter, the contaminants, the heavy metals, lead, arsenic and things like that. Um, they are unfortunately more common than you might think. So taking a soil sample, um, this is recommended every one to three years, even for folks who may not consider themselves commercial farmers, you still want to um, know what you're working with in there and also kind of replenish nutrients that um, uh, may be depleted year after year if you're not doing things like uh, crop rotation. Um, you, of course, want a, a clean sampling tool, go down at least a foot um, and a minimum of two cups uh, in a Ziploc bag or a jar when you uh, send it in. Um, we do have a link at the bottom here um, if you're interested in utilizing that lab where we have other um, links to various labs that may be closer to you depending on uh, where you're located and where you're tuning in from today. Um, of course, keeping it in a cool, dry place is important too. Oftentimes folks will freeze the bags before mailing it in uh, to a lab to figure out what you're, you're dealing with in the soil. Um, and if you are interested more in learning about the contaminants or other aspects other than the nutrient content, uh, feel free to reach out to us because those will um, likely be different labs that you'll want to send it into. 
so proper soil drainage. Um, so oftentimes folks around here, they can have really sandy soil that may drain quickly, or they can have really compact clay soil uh, that'll drain slowly. Um, some of these uh, soil amendments you can see for both may um, have a little bit of an overlap, um, but they do still work for mitigating either issue. Um, it's, it's important too that for the most part, these uh, amendments you're gonna wanna mix in a little bit below the soil surface, maybe the hay or the leaf litter, uh, various mulches you can leave towards the top. But in general, you know, the compost, um, the gypsum, uh, coconut core, things like that, you're gonna want to actually mix in a little bit below the soil surface to get the, the greater effect um, from them. So talking about mulch, some of these benefits, uh, controlling weeds, you know, a lot of times when we implement uh, community garden spaces across Snohomish County, uh, we'll love to implement practices that will reduce labor and upkeep and maintenance involved over time. And one of those things we implement um, includes mulching around the garden area, whether it's a raised bed or just a garden um, bed directly in the ground. Uh, mulching around that space really helps control weeds over time and reduce labor. Um, retain soil moisture. Um, over the winter months, we're going to have a lot harsher weather. And so uh, these nutrients can leach out of the soil. Um, the soil moisture can be um, evaporated elsewhere. And so retaining that moisture is important. Um, also uh, reducing soil compaction. Uh, you can see here there's a tire tread, but it doesn't take a large pickup truck to make your, your garden bed compact. Just walking on it a little bit over time can do that or just um, weatherization can do that also. So uh, reducing that compaction is really important to have um, a larger amount of beneficial insects and microbes in the soil, uh, which will increase your, um, uh, your success rate and your yield in the following upcoming growing season. So how much do you need, do you ask? Um, thinking about how much mulch or, or compost you might need for a garden space. All you're going to do is use this uh, website or you can use, there's a lot of other comparable websites out there and then you just type in the square footage so the length and width of the garden space as well as the depth that you'd like to have the mulch. Um, from there this website will be able to tell you the approximate number of yards that you'll need um, which is really useful. Um, as an example of what to do and what not to do. And the what to do um, picture in the farther back tree, it's harder to see, but it is much lower to the ground, uh, the way that they've um, added the mulch around the base of the tree. Kind of stopping around the root flare where the roots go um, outward off to the side or, or down. Um, so you really don't wanna add it more than a couple inches uh, after that. And of course the tree closest to us is, is done wrong and um, used something called volcano mulching where it can really um, rot out the base of the tree quite quickly, unfortunately. So a lot of trees will experience um, root rot at the base and just fall over, just keel over from that. So it's, um, it's counterintuitive to um, think that mulching is gonna kill the tree, but in fact it can. So uh, just avoiding that practice as best as possible is, is a good thing to go by. Um, sheet mulching. This is a really great um, way, again, to reduce labor. Um, there's a couple ways to go about it. If you want it to be really simple, um, you can just do a layer of uh, cardboard and then wood chip mulch on top. Um, but if you're dealing with more um, uh, kind of uh, pests, garden pests, or um, specifically um, invasive um, weeds that will come in and, and send runners out uh, is what I meant to say. Things like morning glory, um, blackberry, ivy, those things are, are really um, uh, obtrusive and they can really get in there and hard to get out. And so um, what sheet mulching can do is it can prevent the light from actually reaching those root systems and the plants themselves. And the larger or the longer amount of time that you can start these plants from light um, the greater your success rate of keeping them at, at bay for longer periods of time. Um, and so if you lay down uh, the cardboard layer, it'll actually um, break down over a few months and, and add a, couple, a few nutrients to the soil. But in that process of breaking down, it'll starve out the light from reaching that plant. Um, and then what you're left with is a nice clean looking 
uh, soil surface of uh, wood chip mulch. So again, it can retain moisture, uh, help uh, nutrients from leaching out of the soil and, and help create a healthy soil content below for those plants root systems. Um, here's a more in-depth um, uh, option of, uh, of sheet mulching. Um, this can definitely be useful if you're looking to starve out um, uh, really pervasive weeds uh, or some of those um, Ivy, Morning Glory, Blackberry type options I was mentioning as well. Um, so a really great way to reduce labor over time and not have to worry about weeding. Uh, knowing what kind of dirt you're working with, checking your dirt through the uh, Dirt Alert website from uh, the Department of Ecology is, would be a great option, especially if you find yourself in any of these um, areas highlighted on the map. I know that, um, you know, Snohomish King, Pearson, Thurston County have all had different um, smelters, smelting plants, um, where there's been some heavy metals and harmful chemicals that have um, leached into the soil over time. And then I also know there's a couple spots in Eastern Washington and Northeast Washington where there's been apple orchards that have had um, arsenic and various things uh, leach into the soil from older practices of, of growing apples over there as well. So it really can affect you know, both sides of the mountains here in this state. And um, it's really a good thing to keep an eye on. Um, if you have uh, questions about it, feel free to reach out to us or uh, just check out this website. Um, and I would suggest, you know, if you did end up having, having any of these um, contaminants that you're going to want to, you know, remove that soil, which can be a, a costly process. You can also um, look into uh, implementing raised garden beds. So you can actually separate the soil that you're using from the soil in your yard. Um, and then I know that uh, various entities like the Department of Ecology, sometimes if you fall within their um, a specific zone, they may be able to help you with some of those mitigation um, practices, but you'll have to reach out to them. Um, composting at home. So if you wanna keep uh, your soil uh, healthy and you wanna add compost to it over time in these winter months, and you also wanna save on composting, composting at home is a great way to go about it. Uh, keeping that food waste in kind of a closed loop system in your own yard um, is really handy and a, a good way um, to help out the environment and help your pocketbook at the same time. Um, Again, some of those uh, main uh, nutrients that you're looking for for a lot of these uh, fruits and vegetables that you might be interested in growing uh, can include nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and potassium or N, P, and K. Um, and these are definitely prevalent in, uh, in most compost. Uh, it also, along with mulch, can uh, increase the water holding capacity. Um, so you, during the winter months, one of the the benefits of having a garden um, with you know, native perennials or things that are dormant but still alive in your garden is you actually don't have to think about watering quite as much or sometimes at all. Um, and so having some of these things that can help retain that moisture content are really great for um, less labor involved in the growing off season. Hey, Joe, I have a question for you. Oh yeah. Um, Larry asks, how about putting a plastic cover over to prevent leaching? Sure, so um, uh, cloches are something that uh, can be good for keeping plants warm over the winter months. Um, for keeping nutrients from leaching out of the soil, I think plastic covers could potentially do that because a lot of it has to do with weatherization, but a lot of, some of it that's uh, leaching out too also has to do with you know, water flowing through the soil um, so I guess if it was a, a water, um, if it blocked the water, then technically, you know, it wouldn't leach out, but it also wouldn't leach in. And so just thinking about, um, you know, how wet is the soil? Are you keeping water away from it? Um, and that kind of thing. If it's something where the, the plastic is underneath the soil and it's kind of a barrier between the, the deeper um, layers of the ground and the topsoil you're growing out of, um, that may potentially help keep nutrients in as well. Um, I personally lean away from those because I've had a lot of experience with them disintegrating over time and then you end up cleaning up a lot of bits and pieces. But I think that it, it, could, it could help. Um, you'll just wanna make sure that the soil is getting water in the first place and that it's not um, preventing any water from permeating down below. That's great. And I am putting the links that you have on your slides in the chat so people can find them there. And for anybody watching on Facebook, feel free to ask questions there and I will pass them to Joe as well. So thanks, Joe. Oh, perfect. 
Yeah. Um, reducing rainwater runoff. So um, this is important. This is something that, um, you know, the conservation district looks into quite a bit. Uh, a lot of what I do specifically has to do with kind of balancing food security issues and natural resource conservation. And then if you um, are familiar with the conservation districts or just familiar with a lot of um, some of the environmental issues that Western Washington's dealing with, you've probably familiar that a lot of the, um, the pollution and um, contamination that we deal with is uh, pollutants going into the Puget Sound from large storm surges carrying um, you know, uh, contaminants from parking lots, from non-permeable surfaces, and from, um, you know, carb drippings from driveways, fertilizers from lawns. They take this and they bring it into local waterways, and this can affect ecosystems, affect salmon health, and in turn, uh, you know, all the way to affecting, um, you know, orcas. Uh, so this can really be a major issue, and the better that we can slow a storm surge and filter uh, rainwater um, runoff, the better. And so compost, mulch, uh, rain gardens, um, implementing more green spaces, all these things can really help with reducing uh, rainwater runoff and slowing that storm surge and filtering uh, the contaminants from that. Um, so this also can help uh, increase drainage and aeration. Um, you don't necessarily need to um, put, uh, kind of get those holes in your lawn um, through various means to uh, resod it and that kind of thing to get the same effect. You can actually just apply um, uh, compost there and it'll help uh, both retain moisture and create these different air pockets that are just the right size for nutrients and water to cycle through. Um, as I mentioned, fertilizers are an unfortunate side effect of some lawns. And so uh, reducing the need for fertilizers in lawns or in um, application in your garden beds, it can be great for local ecosystems. Um, and so uh, implementing, um, you know, more um, natural ways and organic ways through composting is a great way to go about getting those similar nutrients, but um, through more of a slow release method and a safer method for the environment. Uh, mobilizing and degrading pollutants, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I mentioned that a little bit um, but as you can see in this picture here, it's a good example of what looks like uh, drippings from a car entering the local waterway. And so anytime you can replace um, uh, non-permeable surfaces with uh, green spaces and have um, compost and, and native plants root systems, um, you're definitely gonna uh, reduce this effect from happening. Uh, of course, uh, reducing food waste from entering the waste stream is a great way um, to help out the environment and also um, keep it in a closed loop system in your yard where you can end up spending less on, uh, on compost from the store. So this is, a, again, a good environmental benefit from a, um, a practice that can also help with local food security. Uh, getting back to compost um, upkeep over time, a good rule of thumb, turning it every five to 10 days. Sometimes they have uh, composting systems now where you can kind of rotate it and hand crank it and it, we won't need to get into the labor intensive aspects of um, you know, turning it with a pitchfork or a shovel um, to get that aeration in there that will really help thrive those uh, beneficial insects and microbes. Um, but once it heats up, once you start to see steam coming off it, if you really wanna get fancy, you can get an internal thermometer or a longer thermometer, to try and measure the heat on the inside. Um, and see if it reaches around 130 degrees. But um, without getting too technical, um, once you feel like it's starting to get warm, uh, turning it every five to 10 days is a great way to go about it, getting that aeration in there. Um, this is a great um, kind of rule, rule of thumb to look at for layering approach for a healthy compost pile at home. Um, great recipe shown here for having a healthy balance of uh, kind of a carbon and nitrogen ratio uh, or green and brown as this one breaks down um, in your compost pile. And uh, a lot of folks may just focus on one or the other, but when you do that, um, it'll either break down too slowly or it'll get too saturated and start to smell. And so having a healthy balance is gonna expedite the breakdown process and also um, it's gonna smell a lot better. Uh, what not to add. So. Um, a lot of these are, are common knowledge, um, primarily for um, having a healthier 
um, soil content and, and outcome of your compost heap, but also um, to uh, prevent rodents from getting in there as well. So uh, you want to keep you know out pet waste if you're using this not only for um, yard uh, scraps, but also scraps from the kitchen, just keeping in mind washing out your eggshells, uh, adding the egg um, uh, eggshell in there is fine, just washing out the insides first and, and staying away from these things. Uh, another thing that I'd want to mention too is um, this time of year, uh, I'll get into this in a moment, but throwing out your decaying and diseased plant matter from the garden is a good way to, to um, keep the upcoming growing season safe and, and healthy. Uh, and keeping those plants safe and healthy, but also not putting those scraps into the compost bin uh, because they can unfortunately carry diseases onto the next uh, growing cycle. Uh, don't need to get in, into this in too much depth right now here. You folks will be able to take home uh, or download uh, this presentation later on, but this is just good, a good rule of thumb for what is the problem? What can be a quick solution uh, to that issue? Uh, moving can, right along in, oh, go ahead. No, can I jump in for a second? Somebody yeah. had asked a question about um, if uh, Paul and Jackie, if a septic field can cause waste in the water. Um, and I'm going to, before you answer, I'm going to put a link in the chat because we actually have a septic care webinar coming up next week. <laughs> um, oh, it'll be Bothell specific, but in general, the information is really good. And that's why you need to maintain your septic state thing. So anyway, can a yeah. septic field cause waste in the water? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I am not a, a septic expert. I would I would defer that question on to one of my coworkers who is more knowledgeable in that field. You know, I work with a, an engineer and various folks who uh, work primarily with rainwater catchment systems and a lot of excavation where they have to call 411 on a, a regular basis. Um, I would say in my line of work, I've come across that question quite a bit. And, and from what I understand, root systems are not um, uh, at a great risk to carry any gross contaminants from your septic system into the plant area. They'll just be extracting you know, the moisture and that kind of thing. But the root systems from plants that you'll grow near um, a septic system they could cause a lot of damage, um, monetary damage to that septic system. So even though it's you're a very low risk from what I understand to getting um, some of the nasty stuff in there into edible plants above, um, those root systems, deeper root systems anyway, can still really um, do quite a big economic impact into that septic tank. So planting as far away from it as possible, definitely not directly above it, um, would be good. And unfortunately, a lot of trees and shrubs roots can stretch quite a ways. Um, and so just keeping that in mind when you're planting things that have a, a longer lifespan and deeper root systems is, is good. It's planning cool. ahead. And then somebody jumped the gun. They saw the rain barrels and asked a question on Facebook about um, what are our thoughts on rain barrels on of collecting water on from the roof for the lawn and garden watering. I've heard that rain is a state resource, so collecting that runoff is technically illegal. And that oh, is a great question. <laughs> um, so I'll put a link in both places um, to explain how the, the state actually looks at rainwater, and then you can talk about the systems, Joe. <laughs> sure, yeah, that's a good idea. And yeah, you know, long story short, when it comes to that, um, there are certain states where it is illegal, but luckily we're in one um, that it is not illegal that it is not uh, illegal here. And so I uh, feel very lucky about that. Um, so these rainwater catchment systems, we primarily work with rain barrels. They're a good size for um, local residences. And like I mentioned before, um, we'll oftentimes implement a drip irrigation system. So it goes directly from the rain barrel into a garden bed, another method for reducing labor, um, maintenance and upkeep over time. Um, some seasonal inspections you wanna do on these rain barrels. Um, as you can see towards the top, there's a little, um, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, probably not, but there's a little um, kind of uh, grate here that can help filter the leaves from coming out uh, of the top since that gutter will go directly into the rain barrel. Um, down below here with this white connector piece, um, that's where the rain barrels are connecting to one another. And then uh, it's, you can't really tell, but at the very bottom of one of these, there's gonna be a spigot uh, where you can connect a drip irrigation to. Um, so just making sure that the, um, the filters on both the spigot, the top of the rain barrel, and the overflow, which is also at the farthest 
um, the top of the farthest away rain barrel. Um, that spigot uh, uh, with the overflow connects to a hose that you'll eventually drain away from your house. Um, all those filters, you'll just want to make sure they're not clogged or blocked. Um, and cleaning away the leaves and debris over time is important. Um, just visually inspecting them uh, is, is good enough. Uh, one of the reasons also why these rain barrels are blue is to keep light out. So if you had a clear or more of a translucent rain barrel, they're actually going to develop aller algae um, very quickly and uh, clog up uh, with that as well. So one of the reasons why we have colored rain barrels. Um, another thing to keep in mind if you're um, looking to keep your lawn, but you want to improve it this time of year, um, some yearly maintenance, you don't really need to mow it, um, but uh, you can rake away the dead grass and then reapply seed to it. Um, raking away those old patches of lawn will be pretty easy for the most part um, because uh, it's dying and so it's not going to have a lot of, of grip on the, the ground below here. Um, and open this sun's setting quite a bit nowadays and as we get into the winter. Um, adding clover can also add nutrients into the soil. Um, this is something that can be kind of a grass or a lawn alternative. I'm going to go ahead and turn the light on. Bear with me, folks. Okay, so um, <clears throat> yeah, adding clover can be a good way to uh, have a lot of alternative that'll add nitrogen um, in the growing off season if you don't want to necessarily reapply the grass seed. Um, lawns do require a high level of nitrogen and so uh, whether you're adding fertilizer or a, um, another thing like clover to uh, add that nutrient back in there, just keeping in mind the high level of nitrogen compared to other things. Um, that your lawn requires. Transplant, transplanting native perennials. Um, this is a good time to do that. Up on the upper right, we have Pacific Nine Bark. Uh, below, we have uh, Ocean Spray. Um, just two options of many, many options. Um, they really require a lot less uh, maintenance and upkeep over time to get established. And of course, during the winter months, um, they require a lot less uh, water. So really minimal, if any watering at all um, can get these guys going uh, over time. Uh, avoid um, having pots out outside when it's going to be freezing temperatures. If it does freeze and the soil in the pot freezes, not a big deal. You just want to uh, water it down or let it thaw before planting it in the ground. Otherwise, um, once that soil thaws on its own, it's actually going to have a, a little bit of a gap between the soil in the ground and the soil that you planted from the pot, um, causing some growing issues over time. Um, again, as I mentioned before, when I was talking about composting, um, just removing old diseased plants from the area that you're planting new ones in uh, is important because those diseases, whether it's fungal or bacterial, can carry plant to plant quite easily. Um, and uh, But you do want to actually keep um, uh, leaves as ground cover around the base of the plant, which again can help uh, beneficial insects and microbes thrive um, in the process and give them kind of a good home. Uh, planting zones. In Snohomish County alone, we have around eight different planting zones. These primarily have to do with the first and last frost dates. I do have a link in the resource page at the bottom of the PowerPoint that you folks can have later on um, and have access to a website where you can find more info on these planting zones. Um, the planting zone website, I think, should even give you a breakdown, depending on what planting zone you fall under, um, good options for uh, the time of year that you're looking at it and, and what um, fruits or vegetable varieties or native perennial varieties may work well, um, depending on your location and the time of year. Um, so, of course, the planting zones have to do with first and last frost dates, um, which can affect your growing season. Luckily, um, in this state, we have quite a long growing season compared to most states, but there still are some things that you can do to lengthen that growing season, including greenhouses, uh, hoop houses, as well as compost. Um, a good greenhouse example is um, uh, in kind of the left side of the picture, farther back, that one. Um, great place to start germinating seeds uh, in the winter time just keeping an eye out on the back of the seed packet so you can plan ahead to know 
hey, the seed is going to be ready and germinated and, and ready to transplant at, at a certain amount of weeks. When would I want to start germinating this in the greenhouse to make sure it's not sitting out uh, for a longer period of time than suggested? Um, hoop houses are great and a similar uh, practice to implement as greenhouses, but they can actually be um, created over a raised garden bed, which is kind of neat and, and quite economically um, uh, or, or quite uh, doable, um, economically speaking, when you're just thinking about uh, maybe a few brackets, maybe um, a few pieces of rebar on each side of the raised bed connected to the wood from those brackets, and then draping um, uh, bendable PVC over the top. They just go directly on top of the rebar, the hole um, in the PVC fits over that. And then from there, you can just drape uh, clear plastic over those. It kind of looks like an upside down rib cage and um, kind of a clearish or translucent looking plastic. Uh, from there, not only are you going to lengthen your growing season of that raised garden bed, uh, but you can also grow things in the summertime like uh, spicy peppers or certain melons. Uh, that require a hotter temperature than we normally can get out um, in western Washington. Um, again, the compost can also help not only retain heat but also moisture. Um, and so uh, keeping the, the moisture and the heat near the plant root system's base um, during the summer and winter months can have its benefits. Uh, some food that you can grow today. So some food crops include things from the allium family. Um, this is thing, it can be things like onions, uh, different garlic varieties, shallots. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is all these are, are, they do look like bulbs. And so if you can imagine a bulb underground when there's a lot of water and it's not draining very well, it's gonna have a higher chance of rotting and decaying over time instead of uh, well draining soil where it's getting uh, proper water, but it's not stagnant, it's not sitting there. Um, so in, a, in one of these slides throughout the, uh, the PowerPoint, I think we've actually, we may have gone through it already, and talked about um, various uh, soil amendments to add um, to make sure that your soil is draining properly. And so just taking a look at that slide um, and figuring out if you have a bunch of um, alliums that you're looking to grow, um, but you have maybe soil that has a little more clay content in it, what can you do to mitigate that, um, that slow draining soil? Uh, the legume family can also be planted this time of year. This includes uh, peas and beans. These are common cover crops. Uh, they're nitrogen fixers, so they add a lot of um, those nutrients, specifically nitrogen, to the soil that you, a lot of other plants are going to want to utilize come the next growing season. Uh, and they also help those existing nutrients from leaching out of the soil during those uh, more extreme weather months in the wintertime. Um, flowers can include things from the iris family, uh, onion family, trillium, lily, buttercup, uh, and asparagus families. And there will be a slide in just a moment that will break down some options from that. Um, again, these are bulbs. They're not gonna be um, from seed. So there was a question on Facebook that it's sort of in this realm asking about dandelions and whether or not they're beneficial and should they be encouraged? Oh yeah, you know, that's a great question. It really depends person to person. Um, bees love dandelions. Dandelions do have some, um, you know, uh, benefits. Uh, folks will make uh, traditional, there's traditional tea recipes. There's different things that folks have used historically um, using dandelions. And so it's a, a plant that has a lot of versatility, but it also has a kind of a, a perspective from many people that it's a weed. And so I wouldn't say I'm taking a stance on, on where you should sit with dandelions, but I will say um, you can go either way. And uh, if you want a pristine lawn, um, there's things you can do to, to get rid of dandelions and we can give you insight into how to do that. But I would also say that there's a time and a place for dandelions and, and bees would probably be a, a fan of them if, if um, you asked a bee. So <laughs> it's uh, really up to you. Perfect, thanks, Jill. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, again, some of these flower bulbs you can grow today from the families uh, on the left can include things like daffodils, uh, ornamental onions, trillium, uh, things like violet star, grape hyacinth, uh, various iris varieties, crocus, um, uh, dog's tooth violets, mission bells, snowdrop. Um, there's really a great uh, variety to choose from for uh, bulbs you can put in the ground 
to plan ahead for um, come springtime when things are going to start to pop up. Uh, so cover crops, uh, garden weather, winterization, um, what to do again to keep those nutrients from leaching out. Um, not to get too much on a tangent, but a lot of the conservation districts credit their start to the Dust Bowl, which was um, in part caused by uh, uh, tilling, over tilling, um, also monocropping, not rotating your crops enough. And so when we're thinking about how do we reduce um, uh, practices that will in turn um, decrease the chances of recreating the Dust Bowl, we can think, we can think of things like um, cover crops and crop rotation. And cover crops really do wonders for keeping um, soil health over time. Um, and so the legumes I mentioned were a great option for that, peas and beans. Uh, also there, the clover is a good option. Um, various clovers work really well around here. And so just thinking about, um, you know, how are you maintaining soil health even in the growing off season? Uh, another great uh, thing to do, a great activity to do in the growing off season includes planting plans. Um, keeping your planting plans over time year to year can be really beneficial when thinking about things like crop rotation. What did you grow last year in that specific area? How can you move in something else that would maybe give back a specific soil nutrient that that previous plant was taking away from the soil? Um, they can also reduce uh, bacterial and fungal plant diseases in the soil. Um, not to get too in depth, but one, um, one example that folks may be familiar with is a uh, uh, club root, which is something that affects primarily brassicas or the broccoli family. And that's a really nasty one because if that starts to develop in your soil and you haven't been implementing crop rotation and you're really set on growing um, the brassica family again, you'd have to wait up to 10 years for that one to remove itself from the soil on its own. So some of these things can really um, take a toll on the options that you have at your disposal and uh, really crop rotation can play a key part in, in um, mitigating some of those soil diseases um, from bacterial or fungal. Um, companion planting, again, uh, when you're thinking about um, what certain plants take away from the soil nutrient-wise, what certain plants give back to the soil, when you put those two together um, near each other, you're gonna have healthier soil. It can also have to do a little bit with um, a deterring um, uh, garden pests and various insects that you may not want in there. Um, and so we can get into that a little more here. Um, companion planting, you can see here that this is a good option that was um, utilizing what's called square foot gardening. Sometimes folks will um, put down string that um, going up and down and left to right in the garden bed. Uh, it works even easier for raised garden beds when you can kind of put a little uh, tack with the string in the side uh, of the wall of the bed. Um, and so this can really uh, be a really tangible, easy way to break down these different squares um, uh, foot by foot of the garden space. Um, as I mentioned, not only are uh, companion plants good for giving back certain nutrients that other plants are taking away from the soil, but they can also do wonders for um, uh, deterring uh, insects and, and various garden pests. Not to say all insects are pests because they're not, but certain ones may be affecting your, um, your fruits or vegetables in ways that you would uh, prefer to, um, to reduce that. And so what you can do is uh, implement things like marigolds, for an example, that will uh, not only deter plants above ground, but also below um, from their smells and various things they give off. So really important to uh, keep this in mind when you're uh, creating your planting plan. Uh, one thing that may be beneficial uh, to start is knowing either first off, what kinds of plants would thrive in your soil or your site um, specifically, and also what kinds of plants uh, are you passionate about growing? And then from there, when you have a starting point, then you can look up what other plants are considered companion plants for those options you're starting out with. So that's, it's good to have a starting place to go from, uh, and then you can look up later on what other things thrive in the near vicinity of those specific options. Uh, this is a great classic example of um, a companion planting with three sisters, uh, the corn, beans, and squash. I don't need to read this whole thing and get into it now, but I will say this is a, a great resource too at the bottom of the page. If you wanted more examples on um, companion planting options, you can look up later on. Um, 
And it's really neat to just learn from um, historical uh, examples of what works well uh, in the past and how we can replicate that in the future. This has been a companion planting option that's dated back, you know, tons and, and tons of, um, uh, of time in, in the years past and, and really great to learn from um, folks previously how we, can, how we can replicate that. So crop rotation, again, reiterating, kind of going over again that um, uh, utilizing crop rotation in your planting plan can benefit you in the upcoming growing season quite a bit, reducing uh, bacterial and fungal diseases, um, and giving an example that uh, a nitrogen heavy tomato, um, which also requires uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and so they'd benefit from having something like a bean, which is a nitrogen fixer, um, next to uh, replenish the soil from that. Uh, and then you can even follow that from uh, a crop that doesn't require as many heavy nutrients like onions. Uh, so kind of getting to the end of the PowerPoint here, this garden checklist is kind of a synopsis of everything we've just gone through and a great um, kind of a succinct list for folks to go off of on their own and, and uh, figure out what to narrow down uh, to do during these off season um, winter months of growing. Uh, so what are your goals? Are you interested in uh, growing your food, a lawn, habitat like uh, native pollinators or, or fruit trees or native perennials, or maybe a little bit of each? Um, Site-specific options. What kinds of light do you have? Moisture content in the soil. Uh, soil composition. I know a lot of us um, in Western Washington are working with glacial till, which is maybe a little more acidic. So you might want to add you know, things like lime from limestone in the growing off season too kind of balance out that acidity. Um, crop selection, thinking about uh, complan companion planting options, crop rotation, what planting zone you fall under, all these things will help you um, not only plan uh, your, your planting plan uh, in the future months, but what would work well um, now if, it's, um, if you're looking to put in uh, some of those options that we, uh, we mentioned now, what part of the yard would they work well in? What's your soil like that you're looking to plant in? Um, plant resources. So, of course, you can harvest your own seeds once things um, have gone to seed and bolted uh, and they're no longer going to taste great. You can still let them keep growing and then harvest those and, and dissect them a little bit and, um, and save those seeds for the next growing season. You can do seed swaps with your neighbor. Um, uh, the conservation district uh, in Snohomish County, as well as other counties, they all, we all have, um, for the most part, a, a plant sale in this region. Uh, that you can go attend uh, and feel free to reach out to us if you want information, uh, more information on our plant sale. Um, various nurseries you can look up. We have a, a pretty comprehensive list of nurseries that we work with that um, you can go reach out to and, and get some good native plant options. I will say you can't uh, rely on nurseries in general to have only native um, plant varieties. Some of them do carry uh, odd things like um, ivy or, or things that you would would not want to necessarily put in your yard, but some folks uh, don't have that background knowledge to, to know better. And so um, knowing which nurseries um, specifically would carry uh, native plants and non-invasive plants is good. Um, the budget and the timeline, just knowing what, um, if you're gonna plant uh, seeds in your, um, in your greenhouse and propagate those, how long ahead of time would you want to plan ahead um, to make sure once they've germinated and ready to go in the ground, um, come the next growing season, how far ahead of time would you want to start planting those in the greenhouse? Or with your budget, maybe you would want to lean more towards um, planting from seed versus purchasing starts. All these things are very helpful in the planning process. Um, in preparation uh, with your beds for next year, again, testing your soil. This can include um, soil tests for the soil health, including nutrient content, um, what kind of contaminants you might be working with, um, and whether you should be implementing maybe a raised bed instead. Uh, sheet mulching um, to uh, reduce labor, retain moisture, and uh, reduce the nutrients from leaching out of the soil. Of course, some of those soil amendments, uh, compost can be included in there. Um, lime, if it's uh, in incredibly acidic. Um, we also uh, will sometimes use things like perlite. Uh, we recommend uh, cocoa core instead of peat moss since the peat bogs are known to um, replenish slowly over time and so it's a, 
it's a better option um, since uh, cocoa core from coconut husks is a lot uh, red, more readily available. Um, and then preparing your beds for fall and winter. Uh, again, removing the dead and diseased plants, those fungal and bacterial um, issues can, um, can unfortunately transfer plant to plant. So don't put them in the compost and don't leave them in the, um, in the garden bed area for the next plant to, to come across. Uh, planting cover crops to uh, retain um, moisture, reduce nutrients from leaching out and actually adding nutrients, specifically nitrogen, back into that soil for the upcoming growing season is going to be a great thing to do. Um, uh, protecting your plants uh, and extending the growing season, this again can include those, those covers, the, the cloches, the greenhouse, the um, economically feasible hoop houses that can actually go and be attached directly over raised beds are a great option and, and more uh, economically uh, feasible as well. Uh, leaving the leaves, um, as long as they're not diseased leaves, um, these become great homes for beneficial insects and microbes to um, create healthier soil for your upcoming growing season as well. And there's a neat uh, Xerxes Society link there for more information on that. Um, finally, uh, what to plant now, just reiterating uh, onions, so uh, alliums, excuse me, so the onion, um, garlic, shallots, all these different things, uh, but keeping in mind well draining soil will really be um, benefiting these in the long run and, and uh, increasing your yield. Uh, legumes, so fava beans, snow peas, these are great nitrogen fixers and they're also something that can thrive this time of year, surprisingly. Um, if you're interested in upkeeping your lawn, grass seed can be included here as well, a great time to reseed or reseed your lawn. I'm not gonna read all these different wildflowers out, but here's some great examples of those different flower varieties we mentioned. Um, and again, these are primarily gonna be, uh, or all gonna be from bulb. Um, so the same thing applies to the allium family. You're gonna probably want some pretty well draining soil to plant those. Uh, and then of course, um, native or otherwise trees and shrubs, this would be a good time of year to implement those. Uh, you can of course um, trim them a little bit when you put them in. Uh, they're gonna be dormant for the most part. And so it won't affect them too much. Um, also don't let them freeze when they're in their pot or else you're gonna want to thaw them out uh, before planting them. And uh, please reach out to the Snowmish Conservation District if you want more information on uh, native, or, um, native or otherwise trees and shrubs, uh, preferably native um, and good options that would be site suitable for your yard as well as any information on the plant sale that we'll have eventually as well. Um, so thank you so much for your time, everyone. Please let me or um, uh, let Kari know if there's any questions that we can answer and uh, we appreciate you attending. Thanks, Joe, so much. It's a lot of good information. And I hope um, for those that don't know, the you can do the um, save the chat <laughs> feature if you're in Zoom. And I put all those links in there. And I'll also be sending out this presentation as well as the checklist again by the end of the week. Um, there are questions. So let me ask those of you, Joe. Um, sure. One, another one came from Facebook from Nathaniel. Um, Given the wetness of our region, does it make sense to plant drought resistant plants? Yeah, that's a valid question. Um, I would again say that it's kind of site specific, so it, de it can depend yard to yard um, and even parts of the yard. Um, so there's some areas in different site visits I've been on where there was a marsh or a wetland in one area and the other uphill area was quite drastically different. So it really just depends um, location to location. And <clears throat> if you were interested in having um, someone like myself or, or someone that maybe is more, um, has more expertise in, in rain gardens or, or um, maybe riparian area plants uh, and native perennials, uh, we can send someone out to your property and of course um, uh, abide by all the COVID safe guidelines, but um, come out and give you more uh, in-person guidance on what would work well in, in certain parts of your yard and we're happy to do that. That's great. So um, somebody asked or they said, I have red potatoes that grow back every year. I find both small and big potatoes in the dirt. Should I wait until all the leaves are brown before I start digging them up? You know, that's a good example or that's a good question. I would say that for um, potatoes, it's actually a really resilient um, uh, thing to work with where you can actually, for potatoes that are not quite 
uh, up to par with, with the size that you want. Um, what you can do is you can cut out the little green eyes that are coming out of the potato and every little piece uh, of the potato you cut off with the green eyes coming out of it can actually in turn become a new potato in the next growing season. So I wouldn't say that the leaves are the tell all for when a potato is ripe. It's more about the time of year. Um, when you do see uh, leaves popping up from the soil surface, um, you wanna actually keep mounding um, that area. Um, <clears throat> and so there's really not very much leaf shown at all. Um, or at least not very much, much of the leaf stem anyway shown. Um, and so the more you mound, the more potatoes in the growing season it's gonna produce. Um, people can actually even be growing potatoes in barrels, um, mm -hmm. believe it or not. It's a really uh, efficient space saving way to, to go about it. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily use the leaves as um, the way to tell when the potatoes are ready. It's more about the time of year in, in my opinion. Thanks. Um, Larry asks, in spring, should cover plants be cleared? Uh, oh, cover crops, sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, that's a great question. They, you do clear them out um, come springtime, and that way, you know, they've added enough nitrogen into the soil um, for the new things to uh, flourish. So that's kind of their main, their main purpose. Um, I think for the most part, you know, of course people eat peas and beans, but I think the cover crops used primarily um, during the growing off season using these varieties are not so much for food as they are for um, keeping the soil health. And, uh, and you're welcome to try and eat and eat those. Um, but uh, I think that their main goal of course is gonna be to maintain soil health and add nitrogen back into the soil in the off season. Um, if you wanted more information from us on um, carbon sequestration and how to best um, uh, dispose of these cover crops in a way that will reduce carbon from uh, entering, re entering the atmosphere and everything like that, feel free to reach out to us. That's a longer conversation that we can save for another day, but we're more than happy to um, get more in depth in that topic with you. That's great. And then there's a comment, and this is going back, I think, to the leave the leaves, but um, leaves for weed suppression are great. And then they also uh, offer habitat for a variety of wildlife, as you mentioned. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think that that uh, Xerxes Society link will be a great resource for you, for any folks that may have less knowledge on that topic than the, the person who posted that comment. But um, that's exactly right, that they really uh, are great homes for different beneficial insects and microbes. And um, it's a good argument, too, if you wanted to practice the no-till method um, uh, for garden spaces. If you're not doing a raised garden bed, um, really the less that you disturb the soil, the more those beneficial insects and microbes will thrive. Uh, not to say there's not a time and a place for tilling, because um, there is, but uh, for smaller scale home gardening, um, you know, some of these more time consuming labor intensive methods that end up being better for, um, for certain ecosystems. Um, it's a great place and a, a great time and a place to try them out. That's great. Also, I just wanna say I put in the chat the links to the self-guided rain garden tour that you and everybody here can do in North Everett. If you sign up, then I will send you the map and you go out and wander around and see different rain gardens and different life cycles. Um, it's also a nice thing to do at this time of the year because it's wet. <laughs> so oh, yeah. you can see how they actually perform. Um, so in I'm just gonna- time. Yeah. If there's any more questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. That would be great. Um, cause we'll be here until, as long as there's questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I, the other thing I, again, I would remind you, if you want a rain barrel, the city of Everett is selling them. And that is this Saturday, the ninth. Um, so go to the everettwa.gov slash rain barrels. Um, oh, Larry said something about not seeing save the chat. I, it's a good thing cause it's hidden, but where the messages have been going through, there's little three dots. Um, to the right of that box where you would type in a message if you wanted to say something to either Joe or me. And then the first option there is save chat. And then that will just save to your computer and then you can go back and catch it later. I will also make sure that you have all these links that went out um, as well as uh, Joe's presentation and that checklist again. And you'll be able to watch the YouTube video later as well and 
it will be on Facebook. So lots of ways to catch back up if there's a section you really wanted to learn more about or dive into. And certainly I will put Joe's email in the chat too. Um, so you can reach out to him because when it comes to growing food, he is the guy on our staff um, that is helping with that. And if you see res raised beds throughout the community, he probably did that. So, <laughs> um, so if there's any other questions, we'll do a last call on questions. I'm not seeing any more on Facebook. Let's see. Lots of thank yous in the chat, Joe. Good job. Awesome. Thanks yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Washington team. <laughs> Great from CEO and gardeners of Mosaic Community Garden of Chula Vista, California. There you go. Oh, nice. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Again, we will um, save this and uh, you'll find it. I'll send you an email um, later this week with all the information and uh, check it out on Facebook too, or share it. And again, more thanks. Thanks for the great info. Great job, Joe. Um, everyone have a nice evening and a good fall. We'll be back in the spring with more of these. We are crossing our fingers and toes and everything that we might be back live, but we'll see when we get to spring. So thanks, Joe. Have a great night. Thanks to the city of Everett for hosting us and sponsoring these classes. Have a good thanks, night. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Bye.